So I, I'm going to give you David, and uh, I'm not sure you might want to expand on your uh, background as you go, because sure. I'm sure I've, did a, I've done a really terrible job of it. Okay. <coughs> uh, and this is the class. Okay. Thanks. Uh, class, good to see you. <laughs> Um, thanks. So for those of you uh, want to follow along, coevolving.com slash common slash publications, you can download the slides and I'll tell you you want to download the slides because uh, the presentation um, is done in the IBM consulting group style, which means that the content, there's lots of content that is on the slides that I'm actually not going to talk to you about because I'm going to leave it for you as homework. So this presentation runs longer. Um, than, um, than we have time for, which is typical for me. And I gave this talk to the, um, the uh, full-time cohort on Wednesday, and we didn't cover all of it. So don't worry about that. I'm just trying to get the idea across. Um, and um, uh, last year, when I gave the talk to this class, it took longer to get through the content than with the full-time students because you ask more questions. So um, feel free to ask questions. Um, like I'm here for the time. I'm trying to cover and, and get you into the spirit of systems thinking. Um, and it's always an interesting sort of thing. So I, I actually, in, in January and February, I got this really bizarre opportunity to teach a class at University of Toronto. Uh, in the information school, the I school, and so uh, I bought, uh, this is it's a long arc for me giving these talks and these lectures because uh, in 2010, 2011, I was asked to write the system thinking courses for the Creative Sustainability Program at Aldo University. Um, they, that was uh, at, in 2010. It was a brand new master's program. It was crossing. Um, they, uh, Aldo University actually merged the design school, the business school, and the engineering school into a single university called Aldo University. And this was the first master's program they had that came across all of those. And as a requirement of, of, um, of getting all the EU certifications, they had two courses in systems thinking. And the Finns being the Finns, they follow the rules. OK, now we have the course. What's systems thinking? And, and who could we get to teach it? And I was already in there, and another student um, at Alton University was teaching the courses. And he taught, and he, but he was doing it in Finnish, and he had to do this thing in English, so I can't do it in English. So, so, they, so I became the one that wrote the courses at Alton University. And it's been a long arc, because um, having done the experience in 2010, 2011, at that point I was 80% at IBM, and I had the opportunity to work on it. And then after one year, IBM said, oh, we want you back at 100%, and I had to drop the course. <coughs> So then in 2016, I got the opportunity to go back and teach the System Thinking 2 course, which is a theory course. And um, in doing that, uh, we've been working on this long-term project because in effect, at University of Toronto, I taught System Thinking 1, which is the methods course. So I can actually now teach a whole course. Like I, take, I could take two terms doing the content. But this talk is actually oriented um, trying to get you wrapped around not the theory and the method per se, but more practically at what this means for design. So the name of the talk is Architecting for Wicked Messes. I'm going to explain what architecting means to me and what wicked messes mean. And I'm working towards an affordance language for service systems. And so um, one of the uh, student groups up at University of Toronto, um, the, the, the actually the last one to present, they went and they started doing this research. And they go, oh, when you start searching on service systems and affordances, it's like, oh, all the work has been done by David Ng, and all the references come back to the instructor. And I said, not only that, but the associate dean for the iSchool, Kelly Lyons, used to run, or run the Center for Advanced Studies for IBM, which was the IBM lab interface into, uni into universities. And she's the associate dean. And if you have to look at the reading list, her name comes up on these things. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get for this class, actually to jump you out from the history and the background, I'm going to take you right to the leading edge which means there's a whole bunch of history and background behind it that I have. Um, and, uh, and the question is how you digest that. Um, so to give you an example of what, what's been happening with me is in, in um, I've been working on pattern language, uh, which is something that came out of Berkeley in the 1970s. And in October 2016, I went to present at Pearl, the Pearl Conference, which is a Port Portland Urban Architecture Research Lab 
conference. Now this is an architecture conference. And so I'm presenting at the architecture conference, I'm going, wow, these guys are not getting it. So a year later, this, this past October, uh, there was two conferences back to back. One was a social change conference, because Pearl alternates with that, they alternate, alternate with Purple Sock. And the second one was um, uh, PLOP, which is in the uh, computer science community. And what I did is I ran two workshops. Uh, this, this is really bad. That's like on Saturday, I'm in Austria. And on Monday, I'm in Vancouver um, doing them. And the purpose of the workshop was to unpack <coughs> all of the history on why I was explaining and trying to say we should be looking at affordances, we should be looking at service systems, we should be approaching it this way. So I'm going to try to bridge all of that. And for you, um, this is not the usual way to do presentations, but these are the topic ideas, five ideas I'd like you to I'm trying to understand. And number four is the one that I didn't make it through um, on, on Wednesday. Um, and I'd rather take more time, uh, uh, but it's important we get down to number five. So firstly, designing for tame problems versus architecting for wicked messes. Now, you're working all on uh, your major research projects, and so the first question I'll ask you is, are you working on a wicked mess? Or are you just working on the same problem? Um, secondly, analyzing the complicated versus synthesizing the complex. How are you approaching that? Um, thirdly, because anything that you do is going to be an intervention, are you approaching it as unfreeze, change, freeze, which is a conventional way of doing things, or are you thinking about co-responsive movement? Now, the co-responsive stuff, I've only been doing uh, about a year and a half now. Um, there's a book that we are at the System Thinking Ontario meeting. So System Thinking Ontario meets every third Wednesday in the Lambert Lounge or over here. Um, and, uh, and so Peter had, had created this and I created this as a result of the design with dialogue work that he does. But every third Wednesday we meet. And for February 21st, um, there was a book launch for Open Innovation Learning. If you go to openinnovationlearning.com, you can download the book. It's an open access book. I can now tell you about LaTeX and EPUB 3 and Kindle and all sorts of stuff because I self-published the whole thing. Um, but uh, a lot of that content on co-responsive movement is less than two years old. And this is coming from ecological anthropology. I'll try to unpack that for you. I uh, want to make a distinction between planning and programming. Um, I'll hint a little bit of it further up as we may not get that. But planning and, and, and teleology is kind of... Um, ends oriented and programming with teleonomy is more of a biological foundation. And at the, at the end, we'll talk about industrial value chain versus co producing offerings, which are different perspectives on approaching service systems. So, within each of these five, I've got five points. So, firstly, a team problem is complicated, a wicked problem is complex. This is why you want to have the slides in front of you because you're going to be flipping back and forth because I'm going to go through and trying to spend. It'll take me multiple slides to get through these five points. Um, so uh, are you working on a chain problem or a wicked problem? Um, the ways you can approach that are resolving to the prior, solving for the optimal, dissolving to eliminate, and there's a question as to whether you can absolve or not absolve. And I'll get to what those mean, because you may be absolving nature. There's an idea that all architecture is design, but not all design is architecture which if people come ask you, oh, you're, an you're doing design, are you an architect? They go, well, no, I'm doing design, but not doing architecture. We should stop and think about whether we should do that or not. Uh, this gets into a, uh, the original foundation architecture of problem solving versus problem seeking, and then the approaches to that, which are issues and argumentation as compared to inquiring systems. So that's a very full thing because um, Ian Minfroth came and gave a talk at the ISSS meeting an hour just on inquiring systems. So this is going to be uh, quick. So, how many of you have heard of Wicked Problems? How many of you have read the Brittle and Weber 1973 article? Okay, there's your first thing, is that how could you say you've got a wicked problem if you don't know what a wicked problem is? And this is the problem, is that everyone says, yeah, we know, that's a wicked problem. I go, that's not a wicked problem. That's not exactly what Riddle and Weber said. So the first thing you should do, and this is why I've oriented this way, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to get the article from Riddle and Weber and actually read it. Now, in the absence of doing that, what Riddle says, the kind of problems that planners deal with, societal problems, are inherently different from the kind that scientists and perhaps classic engineers deal with. So why are you in a design school and not in an engineering school? What is the difference here? Well, it turns out that science requires data and requires history. You can't do something that someone has done before on a scientific standpoint because it's all new. 
Science requires data. So if you say, oh, I have no data on that. We've never built one before. Oh, we're going to build the internet. Oh, let's look at all the history. Let's go back to the 1700s and look how the internet was. Like. No, you can't do that. It's all new stuff, and so science can only go so far. So the idea of science and history and data, and, and, and this is why the design programs are different from so science-based programs, is because you're trying to tackle problems that have not been tackled before. And so someone comes up, if they ask you, are you using a scientific approach, and you say yes, I go, what history are you using? Has this happened before? Is it replicable? And you go, uh, no, it's all new, and the reason we're doing it is because it's new. Okay, now you may be considering you're in a wicked problem. Planning problems are inherently wicked. Science and engineers are usually focused on the tame or benign ones. And in the benign ones, you've got a formula or something, and you get a, you, you get clear whether a problem has not or not been solved. Wicked problems have neither of these traits, I'll go through them, and you end up working on questions as opposed to answers, and there are 10 distinguishing properties of planning. I'll go on to the next page. So uh, I've got these listed. I don't go through all of them. Let's start off. So a tame problem has an exhaustive formulation. You can you know what the problem is. If you you can actually go and sit down and say, okay, you know, I'm going to build this bridge. I don't want the bridge to fall down. And so the inherent properties, I can actually work through all of it, and you know, and I can work through the stress and all that sort of stuff. Wicked problems. There's no definitive formulation of a wicked problem. How are you going to solve a problem if you can't define the problem? That's the issue. You can't solve the problem if there's no definitive formulation. Number two, there are criteria that tell you when B or A solution has been found. Sorry. Uh, just a quick question. Is it possible for a wicked problem in an early stage as it becomes more defined so, so by definition, no. Okay, and and it'll take a lot of unpacking. I'll, I'll kind of get there. Okay, okay. So there are criteria to tell you whether a solution has been found. So if there is a problem, you could actually know when you've gotten to the end, right? Wicked problems have no stopping rule. No stopping rule. That means you come in, you do an intervention, and someone says, are you done now? Can you leave? And it's kind of like, if you, anyone's working organizational change, it's like, well, yeah, I could leave, but if you're going to revert back to the way you were, it's not going to help. You guys have to keep working on this problem. Right? Um, just dump down here. Uh, the problem solver can try various experimental runs of penalty. So you actually can work on something and prove it. Every solution to a wicked problem is a one-shot operation. There's no opportunity to learn by trial and error. Even, even every attempt counts significantly. So this is a one-way sort of thing. You actually get an intervention. You go and you do it, and someone says, geez, what would have happened if you hadn't done that intervention? Well, we'll never know, because we chose a path. We had to choose a path. Um, let's see. Uh, OK, so number six. There are criteria which enable proof that all solutions have been identified and considered. So if you're in a consulting engagement, as a consultant, normally you come in and you say, okay, we should actually look at all the alternatives. But as a practical consultant, you can't do all the alternatives that would ever happen in a change project because there are too many things and it's not innumerable. There's not a finite set, it's an infinite set. Wicked problems do not have an innumerable or exhaustively describable set of potential solutions. Nor is, there, uh, well described, nor is it well described. Um, let's jump down to here. Science does not blame for postulating a process or later refuted. The science has a process. Uh, for those of you who are into um, structure of scientific revolutions, they don't keep, you have required at, at the master's level. The PhD level, every PhD student has to read Thomas Kuhn and the idea of a paradigm and a paradigm shift. And uh, what a paradigm shift means is that uh, so a paradigm is a, um, when you have a paradigm shift, the best description of it is they have to, you take all the textbooks and you burn them. So you had Newtonian physics, and that's the world, and everybody says, okay, you know, every, the world's that Newton comes along, Einstein comes and writes a new theory, and it's like, now every, okay, so we can bridge back to Newtonian physics. Newtonian physics actually works pretty well on Earth, but if you actually want to complete science, you have to burn Newton's books because he was wrong. <coughs> The social planner has no right to be wrong. The planners are liable for the consequences of the action they generate. 
Okay, so now this is like you have a responsibility because in this, if a scientist says we're working in Newtonian physics and it turned out to be wrong, now you should be working on like Einstein. It's okay, science moves that way. And then we're gonna move beyond Einstein, we're looking at quarks and all sort of stuff because that's what we know at that point in time. If you're working on a wicked problem, someone says you, you did the wrong thing. It's like you can't fall back and say the science didn't have help in. It's like, yes, I own that. You have to own the problem. So read Riddle and Weber. There's a different way of expressing this. This gets in the systems community. It's called a mess, a problematique. A problematique is a French term. Um, and Acoff uses this definition. Um, you always have the references at the bottom. Uh, so a problematique is a system of problems. So you don't just have a problem. You have a system of problems, which means, in effect, if you're looking for um, a quote unquote solution, you did a system of interventions. The optimal solution of a model is not an optimal solution for a problem unless the model is a perfect representation of the, model, of the problem. Can you represent a problem perfectly? In math you can, and that's what they do in mathematics. It's kind of like, okay, here's an equation, this is what the world is all about. And they do that and it's perfect. But when you get to models, all models are simplifications of reality. If this was not the case, their usefulness would be diminished. You actually want a model to be simpler than the real world. Because the real world is super messy and you can't do everything all at once, you need that focus. So you have to be, you, you have to find that, therefore it's critical to determine how well they represent reality. So there's this question as to when you build a model, is that close to reality or far from reality? And that's really the test that you're trying to do. Uh, as I said, the French called a problematique, I called a mess, it was a complex and highly dynamic system of interacting problems. So the interacting problems comes down to the system thinking because the sum of the optimal solutions for each component, you take each of the parts, you solve each of the parts, and you can't take them separately because it's not an optimal solution. So Akoff usually talks about building a car. So if I give you the best engine, I give you a Porsche engine, and I give you the best fuel injection system, and I give you the best tires, I give you all these sorts of parts for a car, can you actually say you have the best car? And the answer is, well, no, probably with all these parts, you can't even assemble them together because they're all different manufacturers. So creating optimum at the parts level does not optimize for the whole. The treatment of messes requires more than problem solving, and he goes through calling planning, but what we're doing is synthesis, design, and invention. Okay, I'm gonna extend a little bit now from ACOF because how can you deal with the mess? So there's four ways. One is resolving to a prior, and a lot of this is, uh, is what you do when it happened before. So uh, if, if it's how engineers think. So we make it work. It was working before, it's not working now, let's return it to the state that it was. So anyone that's ever done control alt delete, that is resolving the issue. That is not solving a problem. Control alt delete gets you back to the beginning, right? Solving for the optimal. Okay, now this is the way that, that science works and engineering works, and so you determine what the optimal is. But what does optimal mean? Who is that for and optimal, the, the, the difference in science here, science um, generally is based off universals. So the idea of science is it's always true. There is no conditions. But when you work in, in practice, you work on the idea that it's conditional. Under these conditions, you do this. Under those conditions, you do that. How can you say that optimal when it's not universal? So that means that conditions change and the problems don't get solved. But well, not only does that get solved, is that when you, after, after you put an intervention in, it causes other problems. So every solution generates a new problem and then it could be that the new problems are worse than the old problems. Number three, dissolve to eliminate. So dissolving a problem is uh, Acoff's approach when he talks about redesigning the future and taking these types of approaches. Um, the typical example of uh, dissolving, um, for those of you who have children, you have two people, you have your two children and they're fighting over a toy. What do you do? So if you're going to resolve to a prior, whoever had the toy first to get the toy, which is like, okay, that's one way. Now you create another problem, right? <laughs> 
which is, uh, okay, this, 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 the second child is now dissatisfied and you have to deal with that. Solving for the optimal. Oh, you guys should share. Yeah, right. Well, you've already got them pulling him over a toy. So dissolve it to eliminate. Take it away. Take away the toy. That's how you dissolve the problem. Yeah. And, and so design is to synthetic thinking what scientific research is to analytic thinking. Now, Acoff always says there's also a fourth alternative, which he doesn't spend any time on, which I think he should. But uh, absolving means that hoping the problem, if you ignore it, will go away by itself or fade away. And so he has elements of absolving. And so I was thinking about why I, I surfaced this, because you have to read Acoff. Acoff talks about absolving, but then I mean it goes, oh, you should do everything and, and dissolve. And, and the reason is that, that I have a different view because if you look at ecological research, so supply side sustainability, this is um, Tim Allen's work on supply side sustainability. Uh, Tim Allen is, as far as I'm concerned, the greatest living ecologist today. He's now retired from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Um, I was, I was like doing some other research, and I ran into another one of his, one of his papers in 2014, and I go, oh my god, okay, now I have to think away, can't go ahead and think again. Um, anyway, in supply side sustainability, um, this is thinking about what sustainability is, and so he actually has this idea, and a whole book on this, it's, it's well worth reading. This is the one book that I tell people, you may read this book, and then you're going to go, I didn't understand any of that at all, but five or ten years from now, you may go, oh, I kind of get what he means. Because um, you hit that, you hit that, uh, hit that level. Um, so the, the sort of thing he talks about is the way that we do sustainability should not be by turning down our thermostats. Um, that doesn't help the energy crisis really. What you're doing is you're actually solving a little problem. And you're not working in the mess. So how does he say you should do this? Manage for productive systems as opposed to their outputs. So turning down the thermostat in your home is just outputs. The system has not changed, right? If you really want sustainability, you have to find a better way. And so maybe you need to reconstruct your whole house so that's more efficient and the air circulates better, as opposed to doing just the output. Managed systems are managing their contexts. Now, managing their context, when we talk, talk about systems, you end up with system and environment. And you end up with system, and I'll, I'll get into describing the context, which is a containing whole. So you don't work on the system, you work on the containing whole. And I'll explain that uh, a little bit more uh, a little bit later. Uh, identify what dysfunctional systems lack and supply only that. Now we get into nature. And this is why when we're talking about absolving a problem, it's possible the system already has stuff that will fix itself. Right? So if you ignore the two kids and they're fighting hard, they get tired, they fall down, they go to sleep. It's, that's absolving the problem, and it's part of nature because kids can only fight for so long. Although it's many generations, I guess we can go on. For, but most kids only fight for so long. Uh, deploy ecological processes to subsidize management efforts rather than conversely. Uh, so just think about this problem. What would be ecological process around your child? Oh, call the grandparents. <laughs> Understand the problem, diminishing return to problem solving. When you actually work on problem solving, you do a little intervention, like if, if you have this problem with the kids fighting over toys every day, then maybe you should be thinking about, some, about how it's really not working, so you're solving it every day, but you're not really solving the problem. So there's, there's a potential here for redesigning systems from the ground up. Now there's confusion, I find, between systems thinking and uh, what gentlemen call the complex adaptive systems uh, community. Uh, and, and so my cynical view, because I'm, I'm, hey, I'm in the system science community, my cynical view of the Santa Fe Institute and complex adaptive systems was bankers wanted to understand how to manage chaos. And so they took a whole bunch of money at Citibank and they funded the Santa Fe Institute and what they got was rocket scientists. They got physicists and mathematicians and they're working together. However, when you look at the system sciences, system scientists are very often, they, they work cross-disciplinary, and so when I'm looking at systems, I include biology. I don't include just machines, I include biology, I include social systems, I include ecology. So here is uh, Melanie Mitchell from 2006 from the Santa Fe Institute, she writes, there's no generally accepted formal definition of a complex system. Oh, great, so we have these people who have been working in complex systems, they're funded, Santa Fe is still there, and they're saying, well, it depends, it depends. 
wait a minute, wasn't science supposed to be universal? Uh, so you create a paradigm and you, and you, you move on that. Emergent complex behavior is even tougher to define. So emergent, and I know by now you probably use the term emergent, you've heard the term emergent. What do you mean by emergent? So they haven't defined that. Um, and then it says traditionally the more mathematically oriented sciences, such as physics, chemistry, and mathematical biology, have concentrated on the simpler model systems that are more tractable via mathematics. Okay, so what we just said was we got a wicked mess, let's use math. Uh, wait a minute. Are we really starting off on the wrong foot here? So you know, let's try a different approach. Let's go over to the um, biologist. Now this is mathematical biology. <coughs> um, and here is the uh, takeaway. Complicated systems are, sorry, complicated systems are rare. Complex systems are the norm. So what do you mean by complicated versus complex? Simple description, an egg, a yolk, and the white together are complicated because you can separate them. And there are recipes where you cook the yolks separately from the whites. A complex, you beat the egg together, the yolk and the egg together, and you now have a complex. Can you separate out the whites from the yolks after you've beaten the eggs? Well, it requires a lot of work to do that, and there's a complex associated with it. Another way of looking at a complex, you take hydrogen, you take oxygen, and some formulation creates water, okay? You're looking for the property of wetness. Does hydrogen have the property of wetness? No. Does oxygen have the property of wetness? No. Water has the property of wetness. If you are at the level of hydrogen and oxygen, wetness is a property of the emergent system that is water. So it depends on where you're looking at it. So when you're saying something is emergent, you're looking for something that's in the interaction between the parts that creates a system, as opposed to trying to take things apart. Because if you're looking for the property of wetness, looking at hydrogen and oxygen, you can look as long as you want, you're not gonna find it there. Complicated problems originate from causes that can be individually distinguished. They can be addressed piece by piece. For each input, there's a portion of output. You control the systems and the problems, and that may create a, per a permanent solution. Now, if you have parts, and each one of them, you could take something apart, like a car, um, and you have a problem with the fuel injection system, you take out the fuel injector, and it's like, okay, you put it back together, that is complicated. Complex problem systems result from networks of multiple interacting causes that are individually distinct, cannot be individually distinguished. You have to address that at the entire system level. And you have these sorts of properties that small inputs can result in disproportionate outputs. I don't, <coughs> I don't know if I like the um, butterfly flaps its wing and causes a tornado somewhere else metaphor, but that's kind of what they're saying. The problem is that cannot be solved once and forever. Gee, sounds like a wicked problem. Um, intervention mixes into new problems. I don't know what the problem. Relevant system can't be controlled. So the problem is that decision makers actually consult to treat complex problems as if they were complicated ones. Now I don't know if you've heard of the um, the story of of uh, the drunkard, drunkard and the lamppost. So a man comes by a drunkard. He's looking at our lamppost. He says, and, and the, the, the drunkard is looking down. And the guy says, "What happened?" And I said, "Oh, I lost my car keys." Oh, okay, can I help you find them? Well, I'm just looking around here. Where'd you lose your car keys? Oh, I lost them over there. Why are you looking over here? Because the light's better over here. And that's typically what we do in science, is that we substitute the complicated for the complex. And we do it all the time. Now, is that a practical thing to do? Well, you know, we don't have infinite lives. And so you have to do something, and so we end up substituting the complicated for the complex. But when you do that, you should realize you're actually under the lamppost. Now you hope that the illumination extends all the way out to where the keys are, but don't forget that you're under the lamppost. So how do we define architecting and designing and landscape and cascade? So, uh, Brady Booch, who is a uh, fellow at IBM, uh, created this interesting description. He says, as a noun, we have this definition of design, which is uh, structure behavior, it has some resolution of forces. So 
Uh, Grady Boots has been in the pattern language community because that's exactly the sort of thing we talk about forces. But it talks about it as a noun, it talks about it as a verb, which is the act of making such decisions. But he comes up with this idea that all architecture is design, but not all design is architecture. Okay. You can think about architecture as, um, uh, in, in, as a subset of design. So when you are doing architecting, you are doing designing. But there's a lot of designing that has no architecture associated with it at all. Okay. Uh, and so we can look at architectural thinking as shaping the structure of the environment. And when you think of design thinking, this is the usual design thinking definition that we have from um, Tim Brown at IDEO. Uh, you have divergent steps, which are creating choices, and then convergent steps that are making choices. So the way that I would frame this is architectural thinking, roughly, I don't want to say, I don't want to define on this, but roughly when I think about architectural thinking, I think you are dividing up spaces. And I think of designing as filling in spaces. Now, when you fill in spaces, do you divide up spaces? Well, actually, you do. But if you go to the point and say, well, I'm dividing up the spaces, but I'm not going to fill them in, that's a different way of thinking. When we, um, I've, been, I've been working working on a new project, but I, I was reminded of, I've um, uh, forgotten who was it that was originally invented the spreadsheet. Uh, when, way back in the days of Visical from Lotus 1, 2, 3. Uh, but originally he said, well, they started off thinking that they're working on a financial planning package. But then when they stopped and th thought about it a little bit more, it's like, well, actually, what we're doing is something much more general than financial planning. And it became a spreadsheet. So when you get a spreadsheet, you don't have any financial planning in it. What they've done is they've architected a framework for you to use, and you could do financial planning in it. If you had a specific, really, really complex financial calculation to do, you might not use a spreadsheet because it's just not going to be enough. But it's, there's an example of architecting something as opposed to designing it because everyone knows a spreadsheet and there's every spreadsheet package has a different functionality they you know they export and import and this sort of stuff and they're trying to create some commonality but in effect it's a framework as opposed to being the contents <coughs> and when you think about this when you think about it think about um, beyond the space into landscape so landscape is the world as it's known to those who dwell therein and inhabit its places of dirty love, the past that create them. A, a landscape is fundamentally about physical space around something. Now, I'm moving towards Tim Ingold and his work, and Tim Ingold talks about the idea of temporality. It's easy to think about systems when you are looking at them in structure, which is in space you can see them, but in time it's much more difficult to understand what's going on. And so temporality is not chronology, it's not, it's not chronology. When you think about temporality, we're thinking human beings. So it's not a mechanical thing like a clock. When your heart beats, your heart beats pretty regularly, but it's not like a metronome. Or for those of you in the music, the difference between a drum machine and a drummer. A drummer can swing, a drum, drum machine usually doesn't swing. The, the best drum machine programs are written by drummers who figured out you can run randomize or, or work on it. Um, this, the, when I start getting into this, this is the point at which um, I was working on my dissertation, which is actually now the book, the Open Innovation Learning Dot, a book. And chapter nine, the first time I wrote the chapter nine, I've been writing the dissertation for about two years. And I got so bored with writing, I started writing about the rock band, the police. And, and to me, that's a great definition. So how do you take reggae and punk beats and put them together? Because if you actually look at, if, if anyone's, anyone here played the music of the police? Anyone ever tried? Three guys in the band, and it seems like it really should be simple. It is the most difficult music to play. It is really, really hard. It's so hard that uh, the police, they, they, they broke up for like 15 years, and then they did on a world tour. It's still number six on, uh, on the uh, world's all-time highest revenue things. But... Before these guys went on tour, they spent five months rehearsing their music. Wait a minute, these guys recorded the music. They originally invented it, and it took them five months to learn to play their own music. And there's only three guys in the band. Um, I actually have bought the DVD for the, uh, it's on YouTube as well. And if you want to compare, um, if, you, if, you, if you actually watch Sting play Roxanne, or a song like that, um, when he plays it and he's really sharp, uh, the bass comes early, before the beat, the drum is on the beat, and the guitar is after the beat. 
when they're not sharp, and you see this kind of when you know they've been touring in, in their older days, is they're actually all playing on the beat. So the police, as they recorded the music, where they actually had the time to have the rhythm, have this temporality, when they actually do it live, it's like they had they spent five months rehearsing for it. And uh, I'm actually was listening to the to the uh, watching on YouTube again. And yes, you can actually go and try to parse out. So there, there's another homework exercise for you. Go listen. Go to YouTube. Go listen to the police and listen to the bass, the drums, and the guitar, and try to figure out they're not playing on the beat. They're all around the beat. That is temporality. It is not chronology, which is clock time, which is what the drum machine would do. Okay, so we're gonna do that, then let's adopt the term task for what people do in that. And now we have an ensemble of tasks, mutually interlocking, and the concept of tasking. So many of you are working with human systems. You should all be working on human systems here, major research project is are you working in the landscape or are you working in the tasking? Because you need to work in both. So when you're designing in systems, and this, my experience in work, with having taught many systems classes, people get the idea of structure really, really well. They do not get the idea of time really well. So talking about landscape, you kind of go, okay, I got it. But what's the tasking like? Huh, I don't know, I'll think about that. Let's go to 1969 when a lot of the work in architecture started getting uh, uh, into uh, their methods and questioning. So 1969, problem seeking was defined as architectural programming and problem solving was design. And this was the, uh, the beginning of, of, of architectural programming. And unfortunately, what happened among the architects is they didn't understand the system thinking. So what does that mean to have problem seeking versus problem solving? So if you're going to design a home, okay, um, you have a dining, okay, so you start, start with the kitchen. You design a kitchen. What do you do in the kitchen? You cook in the kitchen. Okay. You have a living room. What do you do? Will you live in the living room? Okay, what you call a family room. It's kind of, well, actually you start getting to multiple functions. And then you have the bedroom. Do you only sleep in the bedroom? Is that the only thing that happens in there? No, there are multiple things you design it for. So the problem with, uh, with architects and architectural programming is architectural programming started off as a one-to-many activity. So in the bedroom, you do more than sleep. But people go, oh no, the way we do design is that we have one requirement and then we have one solution or one approach to it. And that's where architectural programming got to be dispopular and um, essentially broke down. Uh, so the original conception of this was that you have two phases. One is problem seeking and one is problem solving. So do you spend more time on the problem seeking or on the problem solving? You hear about architects who actually will not take on projects because they're not sufficiently challenging. Like architects always want to take the most difficult problem. Like I want a building that's going to be on the side of a mountain and won't fall off when it rains. Like that's sort of stuff they want. They're doing problem seeking. If they know what the problem is, the problem is well defined, then actually problem solving is pretty straightforward. So when you're doing this, are you architecting, which is problem seeking, or, archi or designing, which is problem solving? And again, we get into this all architecture is design, but not all design is architecture. Now Riddle's approach, I go all the way back to the beginning of this, which was the um, the uh, uh, wicked problems that Riddle had done in the original paper. Uh, before he did that paper, he actually had an approach called uh, issue-based information systems. And what I just does is guides the identification, instruction, and settling of issues. And it does this by creating topics, queries, questions of facts, position arguments. And you, if, you, if you get um, the um, compendium software, it actually does this sort of stuff for you. Um, and it's, you can download it for free, and you create pros and cons, and you have a discussion, you have a nice map. It's a good way of, of mapping dialogues. Uh, but fundamentally, you now run into the question, does this actually resolve wicked problems or not, in the way that Riddle does it? Now, I have a blog post, and I'll, I'll come back, probably won't have time to come to it. Uh, the, I have a blog post where um, I look at three people that are working together on the campus of Berkeley at the same time. So number one, we have Riddle, who's in the architecture department. We have Christopher Alexander, who does the pattern language, which I hope to describe to you in time. And we have Wes Churchman, who is one of the founders of the systems thinking movement in the business school down the street. So he created what's called design and acquiring systems. Essentially, the idea of design and acquiring systems is 
how do we know? How do we know as a group of people? There are four, four here, the fifth on the next page, but let me step through this, the briefest description of inquiring system. There's the inductive conceptual inquiring system. And what this means, let me give you an example. If we decide in this room, has anyone ever seen the whole Earth? Has anyone actually been up? No, no one here has been in a spacecraft, right? So you can't actually see the world spinning. Okay, so for everyone here, the world is flat. The world is flat. So if everyone here has agreed that the world is flat, then the world is flat. That is an inductive consensual inquiring system. Everyone agrees that's the way. That's the conventional wisdom. That's how we know. How do you know the world is round? Because someone told you the world is round? No, you haven't observed that yourself. It's not empirical. So that's inductive consensual. Now, that is also the deadliest way of doing it. Uh, Wikipedia often runs this way. If you actually have ever edited Wikipedia, it's whatever wins. And so you, we, I had this happen in the systems community. Someone um, was, uh, was there, so one of the, the original webmaster for the uh, ISSS was actually a plumber. So, you know, it's, it, the guy is not a scientist, right? But he's really strong in systems thinking. And so he started getting into a flame war on Wikipedia over some definitions. And finally, the editors came back and said, well, if you think you're right, then you should actually be able, to be able to find someone else in the community to come and, um, and edit this page and tell them that you're right and this other person's wrong. And so he reached out to me, Tom reached out to me and said, could you look into this? I said, yeah, okay. So I went, I went on the Wikipedia page and said, you know, in effect, Tom is right and here's all the scientific research behind what he was saying because he's not a scientist. And, then that, and, that, and so how's that win in Wikipedia? Well. If the world is flat and I have evidence and I, 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 you know, I have all these scientists saying the world is flat, the world is flat. That's how you win on Wikipedia. Is that the right way to do this? That is an inductive consensual inquiry system. It does based on objective science. The guarantor of this, because the way you do inquiry system is input, process, output, the process, the guarantor that, uh, that all this hangs together is agreement. You need to get people to agree. So when we elect a government, when, you, when, when the United States elected Trump, was that the right answer? And the answer is yes, we know it's the right answer because they agreed, they voted. That's the inquiry system they worked on. So there's an analytic deductive uh, inquiry system. The best way of describing that is like a scorecard. So how are we gonna hire someone for a job? So we have a new CEO, we need to hire a new CEO to lead us. How are we gonna do that? Oh, okay, well, uh, leadership skills are going to be 40%, you know, industry experience is going to be 30%, we create a scorecard, we score all the candidates, whoever scores the highest is the winner. We should hire that person as CEO. That is used so commonly as well. That's how we know. How'd you get the best CEO? We did it on a scorecard. Well, ACOF actually said this is the wrong way to do an inquiring system. If you're going to do a, a, uh, a CEO hire, what you should be looking at is that the CEO is actually someone concrete. He is a complex system. You can't take him apart. So the question you should be asking is, if we hired this person, what would the company turn out to be like? So I have to tell you about my job interview. I went on a job interview like a couple of years ago. Um, so my experience at IBM was I was a business architect, and so I'd done consulting actually at multiple levels of government. I see this job posting in the city of Toronto, and I go, Okay, they're not going to hire me, they're going to apply. So I get the job interview. I go in, two interviewers, and one person is a hiring manager, and the other person is a project manager. And so what I, I did is I took this approach. I said, okay, so here are all the requirements of the job. You want me to do Zachman. Now, I'm not going to do the Zachman stuff with you, but I'm going to talk about it a little bit. Do you have any doubts I understand the Zachman framework? He said, no. You understand the Zachman framework cold. Okay, great. Now, let's talk about the job. Because if you hire me, you're going to have one of the world's leaders on service science working in your department. And I'm going to continue to do this research. And sooner or later, someone's going to say, you've got one of the world's leaders in service science working at the city of Toronto. Does the city of Toronto use service science? If your answer is no, you now have a problem. Do you want to hire me? Because if you hire me, you will get all my knowledge of service science. If you want someone to do the Zachman framework, do not hire me. They didn't hire me. Which is okay. It's perfectly understandable. When you hire David A, you're looking for trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you start to get this, right? You wonder why I'm not at a university. 
This is one of the reasons. I'd be mean, great person to visit at universities, but Jeremy would probably attest, I don't want to be at a university. I cause a trouble. <laughs> okay, so the analytic deductive, the scorecard, logical consistency, the fact net is the way we know. But that may not be the best way to do it. The third way of knowing, multiple realities requirement system. How do you know? And in this case, they say the model and the data are an inseparable whole. So you can't take the data out. So I know systems a certain way. Now I know Jeremy understands systems. He's been teaching systems. He knows it. He knows it in a different way. Now, even if we had read all the same books, we would process it differently. So you're inside someone's head. You have the idea of subjective views now. And so you can't actually know what would you do in this case. Now you get the experts. OK, we ask experts all the time. So uh, you know, what, what are you doing with NAFTA? Well, I'm not a NAFTA expert. Why don't you go ask someone who's been negotiating with that? They have the experience. They've got the knowledge. And if they're currently up to date on the data, then you should actually be able to do, you know what to do. The idea of kind of guarantor, though, is the ability to see a range of views. And this gets down to representations that people have inside their heads. What you have inside your head and what you can draw on a whiteboard, you've got the complex, you've got the complicated that you put on the whiteboard, right? The complicated is probably the best I can do, and now you know, I'm trying to lecture you about complexity, and it's kind of like, OK, how do I understand this? Well, I'll tell stories. Uh, but that is a different approach, because unlike the first two acquiring systems, it's subjective. So everyone has a different view. There's a dialectic, the fourth way of knowing. One person takes the position of black, and one person takes the position of white, and they debate. They have a dialectic. And so how does this work? Well, as Canadians, anyone that took date grade 10 civics, you should understand this pretty well, because parliament is designed that way. Parliament is designed. You have the government, and you have the opposition. What does that mean, the opposition? It means that the liberals are usually on the left, and the conservatives are usually on the right. But if the liberals move to the right, the conservatives have to move to the left. The purpose of the design of the government as an inquiring system when it's done this way means that they want dialectic in the system. The purpose and the role of the opposition is to oppose. How many people here have done debating? debating? Debating, you've done this, right? Debating, they give you a position. It's like, I don't care whether you believe it or not. You debate the position. The other side debates the other position, right? That is the inquiring system. Now, what, what happens with this is the guarantor is conflict. If you do not get one person arguing black and the other person arguing white, you don't have a sufficient opposition. Who learns from this? The only person that gets to learn in a debate are the observers. If you are a debater, you have to take that position, and you aren't in the best position. What happens is that someone observing a debate gets to see the gray because they get to see one side that gets to the other side. OK, what can we do with a systems approach? Um, with a systems approach, we try to combine all of these. Now, going through philosophy, for those of you who want to dig into this, the, um, the first way of knowing is John Locke. That's a Locke um, inquiring system. Um, Second one, Leibniz is, uh, is the uh, uh, analytic deductive. And Leibniz, for those of you who have ever seen any Leibniz in computer science, uh, comes from mathematics. Immanuel Kant uh, is the, fourth, the third way of knowing. And Hegel is the fourth way of knowing. So you put all these together, and what you want to do is have an approach where, where everyone gets to debate and have a dialectic. So essentially, you take the dialectic idea if everyone gets to be a debater and everyone gets to be an observer, you're starting to approach what would be an inquiring system. Now, has this actually been done? There's actually uh, a book called Meeting of the Minds, uh, which is written by Zaltman and uh, Baraba. At General Motors, they're clients of ACOF, they actually did inquiring systems as part of General Motors um, research. And um, this, these are the people that, in effect, invented OnStar. And so how would you actually have a system that communicates? Well, you need debate, and you need people. So you have the marketing people debating the uh, manufacturing people, because the manufacturing people want like one way of doing things, and the marketing people want whatever the customer wants. You've got the financial people, you've got the customers, and you put these all into an acquiring system, and, and you get that debate. OK, so make sure that we understand everything. 
A tame problem is complicated, a wicked problem is complex. You kind of get a sense of what that is. Resolving for the prior, solving for the optimal, dissolving to eliminate, absolving to nature. You kind of got that idea. All architecture is designed, but not all design is architecture. Got that. Problem solving versus problem seeking. Got that. Issues and arguments, which was the IBIS, the issue based information system versus acquiring systems. Okay. So that is an introduction that I never used to give. This is the, the, I'm now going to go to the second section, which is where I used to start the lecture. So if you came to my lecture last year, this is where I started. So we're talking about analyzing, analyzing the complex versus synthesizing the, uh, the comp, uh, analyzing the complicated versus synthesizing the complex, which is firstly parts, holes, and their relations. I'll get to understand that. Synthesis before analysis, facilitating versus precipitate or participating. Um, then we're going to get some really hardcore system theory with uh, Tim Allen stuff. Talk about high gain, which is efficiency. Uh, versus low gain with sustainability and decomplicating and decomplexifying. So here's the David Ng definition of, um, of system thinking. Uh, people ask for definitions. Um, I'm, I'm more of a Pierre Bourdieu type, so I don't like defining things because now you understand I'm in a Kantian third way of knowing inquiring system. I know stuff. And you're asking me, can you define that, which is like a second way of knowing or a first way of knowing? You're like, no, no, I don't want to do that. But this one, this one I'll hang on. System thinking is a perspective on holes, parts, and their relations. Now, this actually turns out there's a branch of philosophy called Mariology, which is all about parts, holes, and their relations. That's all this. And parts and holes are so basic to human beings, you can go to practically any language in the world, and the parts and holes are discussed there. Um, so when I was, uh, I was doing, working at IBM as a consultant, I was asked to do business strategy workshops in China through a translator. It's always fun trying to do facilitation when you work through a tra translator. And um, they weren't having any problems because I was saying, you know, function, structure, process. They go, yeah, I understand that. Pretty straightforward. So let's get clear on what this is. So what is function? Function is contribution of part to a whole. And so when we look at a system, we have this part, and we have the containing hole in it. If we call the function, if it's, if it's a non-living system, we call the role if it's a living system. So the example we talk about is uh, we'll talk about a bus driver, streetcar driver, whatever. OK. So uh, actually, what happened on Wednesday was Peter was late for class. It's always fun to start a class when the instructor's late. Um, but uh, he was having problems on, uh, on the streetcar coming across. and. So my general rule is, if the streetcar is late, when you get on the streetcar, do not yell at the streetcar driver. It's not his fault. The streetcar driver, like, actually, you think about streetcar drivers have, like, you can move forward or you can stop. Like, they, not much they can do, right? If the traffic is bad, there's not much you can do with a streetcar. So, well, what's the problem then? Uh, well, you need to look at the containing hole. So what is the containing hole for this for a streetcar. Okay, streetcar, you've got the traffic around it, so you've got a transportation system of, of bicycles and cars and all this stuff going on. Uh, you've got a financial system going around it because there's fares that go in the TTC box. Uh, there is a um, civic, a, a municipal level, there is a provincial level, and there's a federal level system around it. So why are we having problems with the streetcars well, you could say it's funding. Well, we're, uh, okay, let's just take traffic congestion. Why is there traffic congestion in Toronto? Is that anything the street driver can do anything about, street car driver do anything about? It's like, probably not. Okay, well, where do we solve the problem? We solve the problem in the containing hole. We solve the problem in the level of government. We solve the problem at the union. We solve the problem in the financing, any sort of thing. You cannot solve it with the driver. So, number one. Most difficult idea is one of the functional. Uh, when we say role, we get organization design, then we actually have people with will, and so it's a little bit different from mechanics, like why we create the difference between non Structure is an arrangement in space. So we have parts, and we all went through the example of automobile parts, putting parts together. Pretty straightforward. Process is an arrangement in time. So you may have one part at one point in time, another part at another point in time. So to see if you're paying attention, 
Which comes first, structure or process? Structure comes first. Anyone else want to argue? Uh, I guess I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> How does the structure get built? Right. So this is, um, it would seem like a trivial question, but I was in the systems community for eight years. I was having a walk with uh, the person that brought me into systems, G.A. Swanson. And I, and I just asked that question, which comes first structure or process? Said, it's obvious. I said, uh, no, <laughs> I've been studying the system for eight years now. It's not obvious. So it's, you know, it's obvious, process comes first. Why does process come first? It's because time is a one-way arrow um, by the law of thermodynamics, entropy. And it all has to do with the way we observe the world. So many of us think of the mountain as structure because our lives are very short compared to the, lives of the length of a mountain. But a mountain changes. Does anything ever not change? So. Structure is the slowest changing process ever. The way to think about it. And it, it creates an interesting frame now. Now you're getting the idea about landscape and taskscape. If you're working on a mountain and you think that you're working on the landscape, maybe you're working on a very, very slow taskscape. How do you eat, how do you eat an elephant? One spoonful at a time. Second major idea. Now, now you'll you take a system thinking class, and you'll go and you talk to someone, oh, it's a system thinking class, and you're going to have someone come and say, oh, yeah, I, I'm a big system thinker. And I meet people at parties, oh, yeah, you know, I'm president of the system society, and they go, oh, yeah, no, I love systems, I understand systems, and I, I'm a system thinker. And I'll tell you, I meet so many people, and they say they understand system thinking, and they don't understand it. And so, what I frame is authentic system thinking. Um, and this is my ACOF definition. Synthesis precedes analysis and the containing whole appreciate. So what do we mean by synthesis precedes analysis? Synthesis is putting things together. Take, uh, analysis is taking things apart. So putting things together versus taking things apart. Now one of the interesting things about a design program that's actually quite unique is that design should be oriented towards putting things together. Now, you may have to do that by taking the things apart, but initially you do it by putting things together. So engineers in this definition also do design work. Technicians tend to not do design work, putting stuff together, like they I mean, snap things together, but they don't put things together per se. They're, they're within a design and they just fix stuff. So synthesis precedes analysis. You want to put things together before you uh, take it apart. And how do you do that? Define the containing whole system of which the thing to be explained is a part. Okay, we're looking at the driver and the streetcar. What is a containing whole system that we're gonna work on? Okay, well, there are multiple containing whole systems. Ah, we got a mess. So, which one would actually make the difference? And you kind of go, well, you know, we could go and start looking at the TTC's relationship with the city and the province, and it gets complicated. But those are the containing holes. Explain the behavior of property of the containing whole. Okay, let's take the province as a containing whole. Now, the <laughs> province has funding for public transportation, and so how do you explain the funding for the TTC with the province? Well, one of the biggest expenses, biggest spending for the province, number one, health care, number two, education. Transportation falls down a little bit lower, right? So. The province could give us more money for the TTC, but that really means they have to take it away. Well, they could increase taxes. Number one, there's an election killer for you. I'm gonna raise my taxes. Uh, number two, the alternative is we're gonna have to take it out of health care or take it out of education. Which would you like? So now you kind of understand why you know, we have enough funding. It's never enough funding. And people say, oh, there's not enough funding for health care. There's not enough funding for education. Well, from the provincial level, they're making these choices, they made them for us, and it's their job to make it for us, but that is a containing whole. Number three, explain the behavior or properties of a thing to be explained, the TTC driver, in terms of role or function within the containing whole. Okay, so the TTC driver, he just drives, right? He just drives, and he does the best he can, he has a job, but it's within the constraints that have come to him. So this is the way that you should do this. And this will be the tricky part um, when you start working on your MRP. 
Are you looking at the containing whole or are you just taking things apart? <coughs> Give me some more more insight about this. Um, Akoff and uh, John Sheet Gerard Dagi, he read some, read some John Sheet's work, um, has, descri has described in terms of purpose. Um, purposeful is ideal seeking, I'll get back to that in a minute. But there are four types of systems. There's determinist, deterministic systems, the parts don't have purpose, the whole don't have purpose. So uh, if you take a car, um, the, a car, a carburetor is a part in a car, it doesn't choose to be a carburetor. The car doesn't choose to be a car. There's the whole, okay? Animated systems, the parts are not purposeful, the holes are purposeful. So my heart doesn't choose to be a heart. It's autonomic, it beats by itself. I, as a human being, have choice. Now, the interesting thing is talking about animated, and this gets into a little bit of the philosophy of science. So do animals exhibit purposeful behavior? We can debate. But generally, the heart in a deer doesn't choose to beat, and the deer runs off. Now, it could be instinctual, but it has choice. Does a tree have this choice? And this is where the dividing line has been to philosophy, is generally trees and plants are considered to not be purposeful because a tree doesn't actually choose to grow, it just does. So you've got the sap inside the tree, which doesn't choose to be sap, and the tree, it only gets one point of view. So how, you know, how is it you actually get that, that choice? It's being able to move and move, change your environment. System and environment, you change your environment. Social system, we have purpose, in the parts and in the whole. So each of us, any group we have um, in this class, anyone can get up at any time and leave. Doesn't really matter. But we can decide to adjourn as a group. We've got choice both as individuals and as a group. Ecological systems have purposes in the parts but not in the whole. And you're gonna find out that you actually thought you knew what the word ecology means. And now I'm gonna challenge you on that. Here's a purposeful one, which is we can make choices individually, but as a whole, we can't necessarily. So we take something like recycling, you know, or you know, garbage collecting and stuff like that. We can each do that, but what nature does, we can't necessarily influence. Nature will make all these things that happen naturally, like that's what we call nature. And so we can't do that. Um, we can try to change the, um, and, and actually the Anthropocene is about human beings having an impact on the whole, but we can't actually take action as a whole. We don't have a world government. So now you're in, okay, we do all the negotiation at the country to country level, which is problematic. That's another mess. Just to be complete, ACOF makes a differentiation between purposeful and purposive. Purposeful, uh, so Aikoff has three, three definitions, of, and this is based off time. So it has a goal, which is those ends that we can expect to attain within a period covered uh, by planning. And so if you have a one-year plan, you can create a goal, an end, for one year, and you can achieve it or not achieve it. There are objectives, those ends that we do not expect to attain within the period plan, or which we hope to attain later, and towards which we believe progress is possible with the period plan for it. So we have a one-year plan, we're not gonna make it within one year, but we think within three years, we should be able to do something. Uh, this is good for um, Bill Gates' description that people overestimate what can be done in one year and underestimate what can be done in 10. And then we have ideals, those ends that we believe to be unattainable, but towards which we believe progress is possible during an after period plan. Ideals are ideal beauty, aesthetics, we have morality, we have ethics. Those are the original Greek ideals. And so can you get ultimate beauty? Well, it'd be hard to define what it is, but if you, if you actually said you have ultimate beauty, you probably set your sight too low. You probably have a goal, and you made that end. But the idea of having ultimate beauty and ultimate, um, ultimate um, equality and ethics associated with it, those are the ideals that we try to pursue. Are you a participant or are you a facilitator? Uh, this actually came up from um, teaching at the University of Toronto a few weeks ago, and I hadn't really thought about this. 
because I was teaching methods to the students, and, and they started going back and forth about, well, you know, how are these methods different? And it turns out that some methods have you as a facilitator on the outside of the system. Other methods have you as a participant inside the system. And this is actually a distinction that was made in the cybernetics, um, uh, cybernetics movement. Cybernetics movement and systems movement are close together. Cybernetic movement, movement actually predates the uh, systems movement a little bit. But they have what was called first order cybernetics. First order cybernetics means you are a facilitator, you are outside the system. Second order cybernetics means you are inside the system. And there are various uh, luminaries here. Um, and so the idea is uh, von Furster was the person that coined first order and second order. And so his idea was observed <coughs> systems versus observing systems. Uh, Pask, who's in the communications theory, talks about the purpose of a model versus the purpose of a modeler. So when you come in as a facilitator, are you actually a disinterested party? And having done facilitation work, one of the interesting things about doing, uh, if you're actually a professional facilitator is normally you are sponsored by someone and you have to go ask the sponsor, why are we having this meeting? And there's always an interesting question, are you having the meeting because you're doing discovery or are you having the meeting because you want to drive towards a certain end? If you are driving towards a certain end, and it could be consensus, so we have an inquiring system, we say, you know, I have a group of people, they can't agree on anything, come and facilitate this group, get agreement, okay. Agreement may not be the optimal, may not be the solution, but it's agreement. That's what you're going for. But if you are in that case where you have a mod, you have a purpose, then all of a sudden you're in second order cybernetics. Are you doing science? You're not necessarily doing science in that sense, and traditional idea of science, because you're not independent standing outside. For Rayla, and we'll talk this about in the biological system. Talk about controlled systems versus autonomous systems. We have second order cybernetics, always have idea of autonomous systems and will and animate types of systems. Uh, Umblebee, who, uh, Stuart Umblebee, is at the University of Washington, talks interactions among the player poles of the system versus interaction between the observer and the observed. And he's also been working on uh, new theories. Traditional theories of social systems have been first order, he's working on science 2.0 which is a theory of interaction between ideas and society. So science currently is kind of divorced. You have this clinical stand back and look at the world sort of thing. But if you're in the world, then what does that do? So the difference between being a facilitator and being a participant. <coughs> there are four terms I'm just going to clarify um, when you're thinking in, in systems that people should uh, understand. Collapse, resilience, sustainability, and regeneration. So collapse, is a is the idea of a system because people want to try to go well what's the goal of the system or should it exist or should it not exist and for me the only real definition you have is does the system exist or does it not exist you can have a system that exists but it exists poorly and it's not it's dysfunctional right a collapse means it, it actually is gone it's extinct so the type of word you use collapse um, if you're from the east coast uh, the collapse of the fishery fishing of the cod in uh, the Atlantic. You know, if we, if we keep fishing, there will be no more fish. You have a collapse in the fishing industry. Uh, in particular, Joe Tainter, who is a uh, scholar on the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, described a society has collapsed when there's a rapid, significant loss of social political complexity. Okay, what did complexity mean? Complexity was something you have all together and not as a part. So if you look at the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire came, Rome was at the center. And then Rome got bigger and you know, got into France and you know, Gaul at that point, I guess, and went over into what's England now. And what happened with the Roman Empire was that the army got farther and farther away from Rome. And when it got farther and farther away, it got weaker. So at a certain point, the whole Roman Empire is indefensible. It just collapses because they can't defend the state. And what he was interested in is the collapse of complex societies. You know, are we reaching systems where they actually collapse? They just cease to exist. Resilience. There's two definitions of resilience, and it's important to keep them straight. Engineering resilience is got to do with station, the stability near an equilibrium, and the speed of return to the equilibrium. So engineers like to think about resilience as something that's broken. When it's broken, how do you return it back to the original state? So control, alt, delete. 
This is a resilient system. You can always control alt delete and get back to the original state. Isn't that a resilient system? Well, uh, I hate to say I come from IBM, we like to find we like systems that don't never have a control alt delete key. Like banking systems. Can you imagine banking systems with, with control alt delete? Just wait while I reboot the the uh, the exchange rate uh, calculation in these countries. Ecological resilience um, has to do with the idea in ecology that there are multiple stable states. Now, equilibrium is always a dangerous word. Um, equilibrium in a system's term, the only equilibrium that exists is death. If a system is dead, it is an equilibrium. If it is alive, it's a different term. There are multiple stable states. So, um, I'm just about to go on to a diet, I think, have a doctor's appointment next week. And so, my weight. I have multiple stable states. So, you know, could I exist at a, at a lower stable state? Could I actually, you know, lose weight and be healthy? It's like, yeah. You know, so I'm living here today, so, you know, I'm giving this lecture, it's not bad. Um, but could I actually be at another stable state? Yes. Um, I learned about um, resilience. I went to, the, uh, Echo, I went to uh, the Resilience 2011 meeting, which was uh, the ecology community. And I came to understand ecologists and, and what they do. They, they like studying multiple stable states. And they study lakes. There's a lot of research around lakes. And why do you study lakes? Well, you can have one lake, you can go up to Muskoka, Halliburton, wherever. You can go and, and you have a lake and it's thriving. There's fish in it. You know, it's great for swimming. The water's clear. And then you go one mile over and there's a lake. And it's like, it should be identical, but it's dead. And there's algae bloom and all sorts of stuff. And so those are both stable states. Having a flourishing lake and having a dead lake are both stable states. And it's like, these lakes are only one mile apart. They should actually be the same. Why do we have different states here? So that's what I call just like studying. And they have what are called regime shifts. And so the idea you could flip from one stable state to another stable state quite easily. But that requires that you take into account that there are multiple stable states, which engineers don't. Engineering resilience is one state. Ecological resilience, there are multiple stable states. Sustainability, this is from Tim Allen's work, of what, for whom, uh, for how long, and at what cost. And as I said, he works on it and says, work on the systemic context. So therefore, you want to always intervene in an ecology at the containing whole level, not at the system level. Did you guys read um, um, Where to Intervene in a System, Danella Meadows? Yeah? I hate that article. I hate that article because it misses this point. That doesn't mean that she doesn't know it exists, but they don't really talk about containing holes per se. And so people miss the point. So where you intervene in the system is at the containing hole. Or maybe you don't. I'll come back to that. Tim Allen says he works at the containing hole level. Uh, regeneration, regeneration, um, and this is actually from Lyle, who is a, a landscape ecologist. If there's looking at plants, you get dispersal through the landscape. But the idea is that there's something beyond sustainability, which is regeneration. And I've been working a lot and focused on regenerative systems, which are, in effect, genetic systems, rebirth, and looking at innovation. So the Open Innovation Learning Book, because I'm trying to describe it after I've written it, is much about an innovation system that's regenerative as opposed to innovation one time only. Uh, I'm going to skip that. Uh, come to the most difficult stuff, um, and this is Tim Allen's work. Uh, we kind of have this idea of complexity now, and I'm going to go. Uh, Tim is actually a um, technically a botanist, um, even though he's an ecologist, the way I study it. And so he talks about um, ants in this in research paper, and uh, talks about different types of ants. There are two types of ants he was studying. So one gathers food. And so your typical ant goes out and you know they're foraging and you know they find grains and stuff like that, they bring them back and they eat it. So they're using what are called high gain materials. There are other ones who are fungus farmers, uh, atine ants, um, and they work on, on low grade materials. These are ants that, uh, that work in dung. They eat dung. And so dung is a really low energy material. It's a waste from animals, right? It's passed through. And so you go, well, you know, what do you learn from that? And so there's a high gain system that happens, the uh, food gathering ants. Uh, 
But you know, you have to grow grains or you know have fruit, have berries or whatever. You need like real, real nutrients, as opposed to these other fungus farmers who are like, okay, you know, in effect, we can eat shit and survive. Cities are like the high gain systems. If you want food, like within you know three minutes of this building, like the variety of food you could get within three minutes of this building is really high. Is it sustainable? Cities are not sustainable. You know, if, if we had an uh, uh, EMP go off and wipe out all the electricity in all the parks, how long would we last in a city? It's like, people will have to get out pretty quickly. Um, I hear that Shanghai would last 1.5 days because there's so much food going through the city. Uh, but if you were out in the country, so if you're living out in Waterloo, Waterloo is actually a much more stable city. They have lots of farming around the area. Like you go to the farm and it's like, okay, so can't go to the grocery store today, you know. I, you know, we have our own animals, we have our own food, we're not gonna starve. So the, the idea of a city as a high gain system means you get more efficiency, but a low gain system is more sustainable. Let me take this one step and then give you a little story that I used to tell. Um, so what, what does this mean when we're actually trying to design systems? There's two ways of changing systems. One of them is horizontal di differentiation. This is a complicated structure. And what we do is that we add on more parts. The other one is a, a vertical differentiation which we add into the hierarchy. So here's the story. So Adam is a pizza operator. Very successful entrepreneur. Creates a takeout pizza shop. Makes lots of money. Makes lots of money. How do you think he should expand? Oh, okay, he has two alternatives. One, he's got a, his pizza operation is a one story building. What he could do is he could actually put a second story on it, convert that pizzeria into a restaurant. Uh, there's one oven, pretty good, one property tax. It's actually more efficient to do that. Um, the pizza oven is on all the time. Sticking another pile of dough in, another clump of dough, and cooking it, it's not a big deal. So, you know, it's very efficient to do that. What's the other alternative to that? Well, so Adam has a brother. Adam's on the east side of Toronto. Why didn't they fund the brother to open the west side? And he had a second pizza operation. So now you've got two takeout pizza places. You get one number that phones in. It's like Adam handles the east side. His brother handles the west side. That's a complicated structure. Okay, you got two ovens. Why would you want two ovens? It's like, isn't this like bad? It's like, yeah, you're burning like you double the property tax, you've got double the ovens, you've got double the investment. Well, Adam didn't tell you that his brother is a really bad businessman. And so it turns out that the brother does really badly and uh, okay, so the business shuts down. So he's back to where he started, which is the pizza operation on the east side, still doing really well. Um, and the west side one's gone. But let's take the other scenario where he actually created a restaurant, did it on the second floor, and uh, had a really efficient operation, but the restaurant's not taking off. Economic downturn. People will rather stay at home, they don't want to go to a restaurant. So now he's got a takeout restaurant, ta a takeout service with a restaurant that doesn't really work. So, okay, what do you do? Well, you could shut down the restaurant. But actually, you're paying taxes on a two-story building. So what's, this, what's the real solution for that? If you had a two-story building, you're paying taxes on it, the simple solution, tear off the second story. You don't have a one-story building, you're back where you started. Uh, wait a minute, tearing off a second story is not so easy as shutting down a business cross town. That's the difference between a complex business and a complicated business. In the complicated business, you had a flat hierarchy, you just expanded out. In the complex business, you had complex structure. Cities are complex structures. Now, most of you, if you were living in, say, Toronto, you probably remember the merger of the mega city. Okay, so we had uh, originally the city of Toronto and the five boroughs. And this great idea, which is what government always does, we can make things more efficient. 
We can make the city more efficient by amalgamating it. And so now we have one city. Oh, what, what does that do to the services? Well, let's see. I used to live in the city of Toronto. I lived in the city of Toronto. I also lived in the city of New, uh, what's now North York. It used to be the borough of North York. And in the city of Toronto, twice a week garbage pickup. And, um, uh, but, you know, the, um, the snow plows don't go out that often. We're on city streets, I don't really care because, you know, I can walk to the store and all that stuff. But, uh, in North York, um, they used to have once a week garbage pickup, but they would have um, snow plows that would come in and would clear all the, the uh, furrows, as they call them. So when a plow comes by your driveway and it goes by, it blocks the car in because you've got now, you know, six feet where you had nothing before, right? So the, in, in North York, the snow plows were always instructed to go and clean out every driveway. Oh wow, yes, I know. <laughs> if you lived in the city before Mega City, they would clean out your driveway for you. But the cost, what was the cost of that? You can only have one, you can only have one garbage pickup a week, but we'll clean out your driveway for you. You kind of go, you know, the driveways in North York are pretty big. In Toronto, it's like, you want to clean out my driveway? I don't have a driveway. So, you know, so what do we have now? Mega City. Mega City means once a week pickup, whole city, and North York does not get their furrows cleared. It's more efficient. Is it more efficient? Well, we could have this complicated thing, right? And so, uh, and, uh, and so I was just having this discussion with, with, um, uh, with Adam and with Jeremy at the beginning about um, the province of Ontario health system. So how are we approaching the health system, eHealth Ontario? We need a new system. We need one system. Let me tell you how IBM made money from 2000 to 2011. That's part of the research work I did. Um, I, li I like the case of the IBM telephone directory. IBM is a multinational enterprise, works in like 50, 60 countries, something like that. Um, and we come from the days of mainframe. So every country had its own telephone directory, because every one country had their own mainframe. Okay, IBM is now a global enterprise. How do you manage this whole telephone directory? There's two approaches to this. One is Oh, we need to wipe out the telephone directories for IBM around the world and create one telephone directory. The other way of doing this would be, well, actually the telephone directories are working well. We have this new technology called internet. Internet is not what people think. It is not a network. It is between networks. So the telephone systems, telephone directories work fine in every country. We'll just do it so that they sync. And so when you change the uh, phone number in the Canadian telephone directory, in the French directory, it gets updated in a database over there, and they know. But the change is done in the Canadian telephone directory, not a global telephone directory. That is fundamentally what the internet is about. Internet is about complicated systems. If we had one mainframe for the whole world, it would be a complex system. Now, if we only had one mainframe for the world, is that actually a good idea? Well, it's actually more efficient. You actually only need uh, one power supply, and you can optimize for that. And when it turns out you need mainframe programmers to go with very many of them around. But you only have one mainframe for the world, so it's like you don't need people on a server farm. Uh, one, of the, one of the big uh, things, um, I remember in the days of IBM, eBay moved off their servers onto a mainframe. And you kind of go, why would they do that? It's because, well, you have the choice. You can manage like one or two or three, four mainframes, or you can manage one or two, three hundred servers. And it's like maybe managing a few mainframes in a network is not as bad as managing a thousand servers, because that's what it takes to run that sort of operation. So, complexity, complicatedness, um, and the distinction between them. Okay, so we've covered parts, holes, and their relations, the definition of system thinking. So this is before analysis, facilitating participating. High gain and low gain, and high gain means efficiency with a collapse. Low gain is means sustainability, and the idea now of changing with the pizza shop operation. And good time for coffee, good time for break. <laughs> and we are 10 minutes behind, at least 10 minutes behind where we were last time. Uh, yes, on Wednesday, so I'll be skipping stuff. So. <laughs>